Okay, guys, welcome back. Uh, we have got a great guest today here, Addie Bigger. She is a true luminary in the Nashville real estate scene and not only a dedicated professional, but also a devoted wife and mom. You know, she was an immigrant and a refugee from Laos, yeah. and she brings a lot of unique perspective to her work fueled by her passion for, for excellence. And with a lot of years of experience under her belt, uh, she's a lot of accolades she has. She's been on uh, in magazines with Music City Lifestyle In Focus magazine, Real Producers, and she right now has the role of principal broker with a firm that I'm sure you know, Director of Sales at Middleton City's largest luxury boutique firm, Luxury Homes International. And uh, she's definitely a force to be reckoned with. So her intimate knowledge of the national landscape coupled with her unwavering commitment to excellence, excellence makes her the go-to guru for all things real estate here in Music City. And beyond uh, real estate, she's deeply involved in the arts community. She's on the board of Nashville the North Nashville Arts Coalition. She's also passionately supports Shearhaven, which I think is really cool, as the Middle Tennessee yeah. ambassador contributing to the organization's vital mission of aiding domestic violence survivors. So she's a self-proclaimed foodie and health enthusiast. Uh, she's married with one child, and she embodies the balanced approach to life, both in business and personal. So good to have you. Thank you yeah, for having yeah. me. It's fun yeah. to be here. Thank you so much. So. We actually met over at uh, the Golf Sanctuary. Yes. So I think you were hosting an event. I remember an investor over there. And so um, our, our good friend, uh, Michael, uh, connected us, Michael Shin. So he's also been on the podcast. Oh, he has? So, yeah, he's been on the podcast and kind of told about his story and kind of how it all started. So, But tell us a little bit about your story. Like, uh, I know you've got, uh, I love immigrant stories. Yes. So just take it back as far as you want. Okay, um, so my dad was in the proxy U.S. Army that was set up during the Vietnam conflict in Laos. So if you guys know that story, you know that Laos is the most bombed place in, I mean, on the planet um, during that time. And whenever the CIA withdrew that proxy army that never existed, so no proxy army, never happened, um, then we had to withdraw. And the journey wasn't short. And, you know, I think as an immigrant, you come kind of like with a, a certain chip on your shoulder, something mm -hmm. to prove that grit, that just a unique will to make things happen right. and being resourceful and finding ways to make some things out of no things. Um, and that's just kind of the way that I've operated in everything that I've done. And it's translated in all the things that I've done personally and professionally. Um, growing up, I mean, we are immigrants, and you know, my dad was a helicopter pilot before coming here. Um, unfortunately, those things don't just translate. So he came from being a pilot to working in the sanitation departments, third shift at food commissary buildings. And what I saw as a child was my dad working, you know, double shifts seven days a week, um, taking double pay on the weekends, taking triple pays to work holidays, and. We were just kind of raised in that mentality, like you make do and you use all your efforts and um, there are no handouts. Yeah. There are no handouts. Um, so it was never even in his stream of consciousness or my mom who's equally hardworking to think that, you know, with what they earn, with how much they work, there's eight of us, I'm the youngest of eight, oh, wow. that they still would have qualified for, I'm sure, services to aid, um, you know, all the entitlement services, but never, just never a thought. How old were you when you moved to the States, and did you move directly to Tennessee? Mm -hmm. um, four, and a half when we, uh, four and a half when we landed. So about this time in 1983. It was October 1983 wow. is when my, when my family arrived in Tennessee. And the reason why we um, came to Tennessee, we didn't choose Tennessee, not directly. My grandparents made the move first, and then Catholic Charities was our sponsoring charity to help us navigate and get us here so that's how we landed here wow wow and so you weren't always in real estate though i, I mean, wasn't you, what tell us about kind of your journey to, I mean, you were in medical yeah so kind of a true nashvilleian i guess and a glutton for punishment if you will um i spent 20 years in the healthcare it space so you know i made my rounds through um to see the usual suspects right i, I worked at healthways when it was mm -hmm. Healthways and Ben Lidl was leading the charge there. Um, so data integration, healthcare tech. Um, my last role before getting my real estate license was COO of a software development company where we took different native data sources and integrated into a system, synthesized it, created reports for people who can actually take action and use them to help people right. better their lives. Um, 
insurance folks who take then you know go to their large employers and say hey this percentage of your population are smokers here are programs that can help mm. and if you get them healthier then that reduces your cost which then reduces the cost to cover them which then helps everybody out wow so how many years in real estate now five what years in, five years mean? done six wow. going in my sixth year so you were on a pretty steep trajectory then yes yeah so talk about that like how did you how did that come about uh, you know there are a lot of traditional co agent at first and you know, traditional like, agent at first and a lot of co-conspirators that have made where i am happen <laughs> i did not set out to become a real estate broker a principal broker that was kind of the thing that i didn't want to do because i had spent 20 years in healthcare. Um, doing startups and turnarounds in leadership roles, I thought, you know what, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna, what I wanna do is, I wanna leverage that experience in starting things up, in navigating and troubleshooting and all those things that would be, that would make a good agent. But I wanna be responsible for me, yeah. you know? So I, I started with um, Donnell Milam, who was my realtor. Yeah. She's amazing, who gave me my launch. Um, so I started with a team, which I, I encourage all new agents to either hire a mentor or start with a team so you can learn what you what you learn to take that test and get your license isn't what you do yeah. <laughs> somebody needs to show you um so after about 15 or so months into that i actually met mike post on a deal and um we just vibe and just enjoy working with each other on the deal that he just thought if you ever think about leaving your team can i please at least have the first conversation and the rest was just history from that. And I would have worked with Mike at Post and Company for the rest of my life. Mike um, was approached by Crylike um, with Eddie Farrell. Mm -hmm. Eddie's awesome. So Eddie had asked Mike to consider bringing Post and Company to Crylike, and there were a lot of advantages, you know, for us to do that. Um, and then right at my three years, I'm like, you know, it's March. I'm not that busy right now, so let me go take my exam and just have this tucked away. I may use it someday. I come from startups and turnarounds. I'm sure at some point I was gonna get the itch yeah. to do my thing my way. Yeah. And um, so I, I let Eddie know, well, I let Mike know that I had passed and I kind of screenshot my score over to him. And he was like, that's fabulous. And mm -hmm. Eddie says, are you gonna do anything with that? I'm like, Eddie, someday. And he was like, mm, I heard Monday. Mm -hmm. I'm like, Eddie, no, I said someday. He goes, you know what? English is your third language, right? Because, you know, the whole immigrant thing. So I do want you to understand that Monday is someday. So I was sort of voluntold into that position, which I'm so grateful for. I mean, to me, that's just kind of a testament into like what other people see in you. And if there are opportunities to put in front of you, you gotta take it. Sure, sure. I mean, was the luxury market what you aspired to or did that just sort of develop gradually or just naturally it, sort of happen organically it, it happened organically so what happened and how i got connected to where i am today is that a year and a half being at um sitting in my role at cry like i really did get the itch you know there were so many great things i had learned from donnell i had learned from mike and my experience with cry like how do i merge the best of all the things that i have learned over the years and then make it my own and um, I reach out to Nathan Throneberry, who is the president and founder of Luxury Homes International, um, because in my experience in past industries, the people who are willing to share are the people who are successful. Yeah. And because they're not threatened by anything, there's right. enough sun to shine on everybody and just having that abundance mindset. So I asked Nathan for, for lunch and we went and we sat down and I you know, just want to pick his brain on like why did he leave some of the places that he's left and how did he get to where he is today and um, and as I was asking the questions like he was giving me my answers I'm yeah. like no no like I want to know why you did it those right. were my reasons right. and so it just um, long story short he made me an offer we went back and forth for a little bit and then I just thought this doesn't make sense for me to reinvent the wheel because we we're so aligned right. that it just made perfect sense to just go ahead and let's see what we can do together. Right, right. I mean, I, I think I like the name. I mean, because I mean, we live in this county that sure. we're fortunate to live in. And, you know, I think um, even just na whether you're in Nashville mm -hmm. or even outside of Nashville, I think people just think of the Williamson County area 
you know, as a luxury market, mm-hmm. at least a big, a big chunk of it. I mean, do you agree? And, and really, that's yeah. even more so the last few years as we've seen this, you know, a price appreciation. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I, I will say this. I do enjoy selling luxury real estate, luxury being defined as price point. Mm-hmm. But I also feel like lu- the luxury experience is what, we, what we're really after. Because mm-hmm. luxury can mean different things for different people. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, yeah. yeah. yeah what do you mean by that? So sometimes luxury isn't a price point. You know, on the day that I went under contract with a client in Brentwood for $3 million, which is now not a lot of money in Brentwood. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a lot of money to me yeah. still, but it's, you know, it's, it's, that's what it is. And so obviously, you know, my clients felt great and they had the luxury experience. They, and um, that was something to celebrate. But I had equal joy in that same day. I mean, same day, going under contract on a property that was two hundred thirty-four thousand dollars, because it was luxury for that young man. Sure. He was moving out of his dorm room into his first house. Oh, I think that's. I mean, a lot of times, yeah. some of the most fun ones. I mean, absolutely. You know, there's just so much joy. Um, it's just a feeling of accomplishment, especially in this market now, where yeah. it's harder. For younger people yes. to, to break into it, and when you see someone younger that breaks into it, it's just that much more satisfying. I think it is, and it gives you hope because I feel like our Gen Zs and our younger millennials get a bad rep, and they're some of my favorite people. Mm-hmm. They know who they are, they know what they're willing to do and not do. They do the research. They do, they do, and they're a lot more educated than when people give them credit for. Oh, for sure. And I really appreciate their their go getness yeah. in what they want. So the market has ups and downs. I yep. mean, what what are you experiencing? You know, as as because you're an agent as well. I am. So you're selling. Yep. It's not like you're um, just a broker. Correct. Uh, there's a big difference there. So you're in the trenches. I am. And what does that look like now? Uh, it's been a it's been a unique couple of years. Mm-hmm. You, you would even it'd be accurate to say difficult for a lot of yeah. I mean, a lot of agents, a lot of lenders have gotten out of the business. I think that's created opportunities for market share. Mm-hmm. Um, I would like to think that you guys have captured some market share, it seems like to me. Mm-hmm. Um, what has it been like for you personally and then maybe your, your team? Sure. So you're right. I am an agent. I still produce at a high level, and I feel like that's important for me to do um, because I want to know what the market is giving our agents and what they're having, what their mm-hmm. challenges are. Otherwise, I feel like it's empty talk, you know? Yeah. Um, so for me, what has been key for us to not – absorb the stress, not be worried, not be scared. And because if you feel that way, then your clients feel that way. We meet so often, you know, I'm like, no one is going to out educate us. Every Tuesday, I do a thing called Talk About It Tuesday, where I bring the team, we gather around noon, we have lunch and just kind of talk about whatever for 30 minutes. And then I do have a topic that I toss out to the group. And then it's the collective brain power in the group, the collaboration, the, yeah. the collaboration. Yeah. and then we meet again on Wednesday, like every Wednesday. And what's helped our agents is that we're getting together and we're talking about what do you have coming soon? What are your buyer needs? And I'm seeing deals being brokered right before all the eyes. time. Before, yeah. Yeah, right. So we're finding ways to be resourceful. Um, I'm kind of lost in the question now, like the different ups and downs and how we yeah, deal I with just, that. You know, yeah, right? it's been a challenging couple of years. It I has. Mean, I think you answered the question. I mean, um, what I hear you saying is, is just the, the way you guys yeah. are going about it. You're collaborating. Um, it's the resourcefulness that you kind of take sure. from your childhood and just, you know, being an immigrant, it seems to me that sure. you're just, because, I mean, you can sit around and complain and Correct. say, hey, what are we getting leads? And then you can get in. So talk about, like, right now sure. for agents out there. You're a giver. You're a, uh, yeah. you know, you're a um, abundance mindset. So agents who are out there that um, are maybe struggling. Hey, they've been good agents in the past, but all of a sudden now they've hit a wall. Mm -hmm. Uh, What would you say to them, you know? I would say have those conversations. Your deals are in the ones that you've done in the past. Your deals are in the relationships that you have. Um, You can't be a secret agent. You can't be a hermit. This is a people business. It's a relationship business, and you have to leverage those. Um, Every single week, I don't care what is going on in my life. Every single week, I see somebody in my sphere of influence, and I meet with another agent who's not in my firm. And neither one of those things are coming from a place of, oh, my goodness, do they? how can they help me? Mm-hmm. It's really staying in people's stream of consciousness, mm-hmm. keeping that flow going, 
and mm-hmm. keeping them reminded that I'm in business. Right. And um, people give you a lot of information on what's going on. Right. Um, and there's always something to talk about. And anytime you get with any of your friends, what's the first conversation? How's work? Mm-hmm. How's your family? Right. What are you guys doing for fun? It's the same conversations. Mm-hmm. So when I tell our agents to keep in flow and keep those relationships going, and that's how you continue to get business, please don't ever include in the invite, let's get together so you can tell me if you know anybody who's buying or selling. Right. Don't make those phone calls right. you know, and ask if you know anybody who's buying or selling. Right. It's not about you. Yeah. And when you make it not about you and you stop selling, you get to sell more. Right. It's, it's kind of funny how, how that works. happens. Yeah. 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 I, you know, it's so important. I think just... Some, I think some people just don't know what to do, what activities to do sure. right now. And I think you've just named several things. I mean, going back to mm-hmm. your sphere, going back to your people that you mm-hmm. sold in the past, that's where the gold mine is. That's where people yeah. are going to open up. Yep. And But you're just having, you know, conversations with them, asking about life. You know, you don't want to have uh, commission breath. No. You know, <laughs> which uh, could definitely be there if, you know, you're asking, you know, early on, who do you know? Um, mm-hmm. So, I mean, having lunch, having coffee with someone, you know, that can make introductions or just yeah. more catching up with them, uh, you know, I think that's so important mm-hmm. right now. And people want to see you. You know, I tell our agents, like, make those phone calls and don't negotiate with yourself out of it. Because you're, if you want to call in the morning, you're like, oh, my goodness, then they're getting their kids ready to school or I'll wait until I call at lunch. But no, I don't want to bother their lunch. And then you're waiting for dinner time. Then you're like, but they're at dinner. Guess what? Make the call when you can make the call. If they answer, they're available. Yeah. So what's a phone call look like that for you? It's like for some outside to me, let's just drill in on it. So what does that look like for you? You call someone mm-hmm. maybe closed a year ago. Yes. Uh, what does it look like? I love those calls. I love those calls. I, I, I can give you some success stories coming out of those calls because I do this every year with my clients, and I tee it up at the closing table. So congratulations. This is one of the most significant things that you're going to mm-hmm. do. So I'm going to keep you – up to date year over year on what your investment is doing how it's performing and again i'm not going in in uh, as as a fake listing appointment that is not my aim at all because if you do people can reach you and you know that but my clients already know it's coming so when they get that call we're 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 two months out or you know a month in getting closer a couple weeks out and just to schedule it it's fun they look forward to it so i'll call and say hey guess what time it is Let's get together. How about we do lunch? Let's meet at the sanctuary, because this is a true story. Mm -hmm. Let's grab lunch at the sanctuary and just kind of take a look at, based on all the information I've gathered, where your home is valued at now. And you get to learn so much. So one of the recent conversations, she's like, I'm so glad I've been looking forward to this because we do want to have another baby and we want to get your opinion on Mm -hmm. when do we get this house on the market and then here's what we're looking at and based on what you're showing me i see that we have this much that we would get out of this house and even if we're a little bit off so those are so fun for me they're so fun for me because i love seeing people grow which is also why when i was offered to be a broker i'm like great i can help people grow agents grow so when I see my clients and the changes that are in their lives that are happening and it's being leveraged through the investments that I helped them, right, right. I was privileged to be a part of, it's, it's fantastic. Two meetings last week, almost identical conversations. Love yeah. it. That's great. That's great. I mean, I, I think some people, they're just struggling right now just to think, like, what do I do? What mm-hmm. can I do? So these are just practical things, yeah. you know, that... It seems almost like just a natural outflowing of what you would be doing in life. Correct. Even if you were doing a different job besides real estate. It's almost like Mm -hmm. real estate is sort of the thing over here. You're just kind of doing life. Yep. And then if that comes up, you know, in some way. Yes. uh, Then, you know. Do life with people. Do life with people. And another thing, too, is don't force anything. Um, Be a joiner. If you're a brand new agent and you're brand new to the area and you don't have a local sphere, then you can create it. So we all have something that we like. Are you a runner? Don't run by yourself. Find a, find a mm-hmm. running club. Get to know people. And in those conversations, especially if you're the new person, mm-hmm. you know, hey, Mark, what do you do? Mm-hmm. It's natural conversation. Do you have kids? How's your family? Yeah. All natural things so that as you're going through the thing that you already like to do with the people who also like the same yeah. things, then it may not even be them. It could be a neighbor or a friend or a parent or a child who now, oh, yeah, you know, I 
play golf at the Sanctuary with Mark. He's he's an agent. You should give him a call. Yeah. I hear good things about him. Right. Um, so that's a big thing is just joining things, doing things that you already like and being around people who are like minded because yeah. um, people will do business with people they like, know and trust. All right. Exactly. Well, and get the job done. Yes. Right? I mean, yes. I think that's the yes. main thing um, is do they get the job done? So, I mean. Stressful time, you know, for sure. buyers, for sellers, uh, sitting on this, you know, as as the recording of this, we're yeah. um, they're meeting right now. Meeting right now. <laughs> so uh, the Fed meeting is uh, looking at cut rates for the first time in four years. Sure. So we'll see how that plays out. But uh, you know, what's interesting is that we've seen a lot of activity the last few months, mm -hmm. just because, or last month or so, just because rates uh, on the mortgage side had already priced in this Fed cut on the on the short term rate side. Right. So it's been very interesting just to see. What are your thoughts as you go into the winter, as speci mm -hmm. specifically this local market? Like, what do you see happening? You know, I see a healthy market. I see a, a balanced market. And for buyers who have been waiting on the sideline or waiting for a better day in the rate, um, even when it was higher, I still had people who were very active because this is for the agents. I take that out of the conversation altogether, yeah. completely altogether. And I'm not saying, and I'm not, you know, um, downplaying yeah, the importance, it. not ignoring it. However, the approach is, and, and this is a true statement, whether it's 2% or 20%, you still have a budget. You right. still have what you've allocated to pay for your housing expenses. All right. things relate to that. What is that number? And then we can work backwards from that. Because what we know in our market, in our healthy market, is that prices continue to increase. Rates can be whatever. And, and if you go ahead and move forward, you're going to be so thrilled, Mr. Yeah. and Mrs. Buyer, four years from now when we have those annual reviews sure. and you're seeing those, your, your value escalate and you know that you can't claw back on that price, but you can refinance as much as you want, as many right, times as right, you want. Right. I um, think it's going to be, um, we just have this inventory issue that mm -hmm. we just, it, it seems like a broken record that we just mm -hmm. keep talking about it, but mm -hmm you just really can't say it enough because mm -hmm. it's just so true. I mean, we just, until that gap is filled, I mean, we're just going to have prices that are going to continue to go up. And I think Correct. I do still talk to some people and I mm -hmm. think there's a, 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 a certain segment of people that just sort of waiting for rates to, <laughs> you know, drop down to a level that Correct. I personally am not sure we'll ever go back <laughs> down to, but it does seem that, um, the more, sophisticated the buyer mm -hmm. uh the less that is a topic to me absolutely and the better you are at prepping your clients on mm -hmm. both both sides yeah. and you know and the thing that we hear for for the last month since august 17th or leading up to it is nar 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 right. nar 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 right. these changes right. and again that's something that um as an agent i got excited about because i'm you know we have been talking about it our firm for close to a year isn't this isn't new news right so giving our folks the talk tracks and practicing and being able to have the gritty conversations in the office so that when they hit that those streets they can be confident in right. front of the clients to give them assurance to calm the anxiety um so it's you know it's it's exciting like real estate is always exciting to me yeah because regardless of what the market conditions, people have to move. Yeah. There's people have cha needs change. Changes happen. Jobs, you know, um, people come and go, divorces happen, mm -hmm. families grow, families shrink. Yep. Um, you you know. have to be prepared. And, mm -hmm. you know, the biggest thing is preparation, resourcefulness, and empathy to the situation. Right, right. Talk about, uh, speaking of NAR settlement, um, yeah. what has changed for, for you? What are you guys seeing that's different? I mean, is it is it really, really, really a lot different than what than what it was before in the way it's playing out uh, or yeah. not? Or, and then what's different about it for you guys? I think the biggest difference that I'm seeing that I'm encouraging our agents to do is that open houses are now a big deal. They, you know, how, how, regardless of how you feel about them, if you have a listing, you're not ho hosting open houses, you're not doing yourself or your clients, you're doing them a disservice. Um, if you don't like them, learn to like them. Because I think there are a good portion of agents who 
are not comfortable asking for the buyer's rep agreement before they take them to the first home. So we're seeing that people are coming to us directly. They're coming to those open houses. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that's been the big change that I have seen. But in terms of the way that most of us have done business in our firm, the only change is I'm like, that's it? I can't, I can't put it on the MLS and right. I have to have a buyer's rep sign? Well, I always did. I was doing that anyway. I was already right. doing that because I'm a professional. Right. I can show value. I have those consult right. meetings. Right. I don't want to waste their time or mine. I don't want to give false hope. So that's the only change for me? Right. Like, that's it. <laughs> and I think one of the biggest ones was, you tell me, but mm-hmm. this... I don't know if you want to call it a fear or Uh there was this idea that, okay, buyers are now going to, especially when we were talking about the first time buyers or new buyers, all of a sudden now they're going to have to pay the buyer's wages commission. Right. Now I've seen lots of contracts come over. I'm just, I'm not, I've not seen that one time. Right. Right. And so it's like everyone I I talk to, I don't know if anyone I have, it's, everyone is saying, you know, we're not having an issue with it. It's not been that mm-hmm. big of a thing. So I feel like the, the more seasoned agents or the agents that just, you know, understood it, just, you addressed it. We yeah. talked about it for a year. Like you said, yeah, it wasn't like, because like, there were definitely some people who were just sticking their head in the sand like an ostrich and just thinking, I'll get to it when I get to it. That's I'll right. About it. I already know if it's going to pass. And sure enough, it did. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and that remains to be seen. I mean, this guy's out, you know, making money now in a different way. And open up, it's like, oh my gosh. But that's another story. That's another story that's for another, story another, day. For another day. Yeah. But, but it's just interesting that I think the core people that I talk to, the agents that I talk to, it's just like, you know, we're, we're business as usual. I mean, for the most part, I just haven't seen these big problems that we thought that were going to be an issue. No, I mean, the first weekend, I have I have a healthy amount of listings. So the first weekend, it was interesting, the conversations that I was having with folks on the other end who were showing my property. I would get calls, and some would be like, you can you can hear the hesitation. They want to ask, but they yeah. don't want to ask. Yeah. You know, are, are you guys are you guys paying? Um, or you know, somewhere, I, I it's hard for me to take off that mama hat and that you know mm. principal broker's hat. I had one call me and said, my only requirement before I show this is, am I getting paid by you guys or not? I said, no, that's, that's actually not your requirement. Your requirement is to serve your client. Right. Regardless of not whether or not compensation is being offered. Right. And then starts backtracking. But, you know, again, it, it's not playing out the way that, it's not this big scary thing. It's not pay, playing out to where the buyers are paying. Now, could that change? Of course it can. I think when we get into a more competitive market, when you're seeing multiple offer situations and things like that, then the most vulnerable folks are the ones who don't have that to pay on top of everything else, right? Mm -hmm. But what I'm seeing is the lending world has reacted and have given us solutions in ways that it's helping everybody out. Yeah. So, you know, being able to work it into the loan, being mm-hmm. able to segment it out from, right. you know, if the sellers are giving concessions and you're able to segment mm-hmm. it out from what's allowable right. per the loan type. So right. that's great to see. Right. Interested party contributions, it doesn't really count in that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's, you know, I'm fortunate to be part of a group where we've just been out in the forefront of that to mm-hmm. discuss it. I mean, we've got classes we hold and talking about ways that you can help mitigate, you know, the, the, the commission you know what are ways that you can help to pay uh, the buyers commission so there was like you know there's four different ways that we went over but anyway yeah. all that to say I think that as we move forward into this uh, it, it you know hopefully we just sort of plan out and sure. uh, it's it just not as different as it was but I yeah. think the people that provide value are the ones that uh, are having the least amount of trouble I mean they mm-hmm. at least expressing it's mm-hmm. not that you can provide it but you have to be able to express it you have to be able to demonstrate it absolutely you know? and I think it's uh, sharpening the skills of your you know your listening presentation mm-hmm. your buyers rep you know presentation some people maybe didn't have that great representation or, correct you know, or not one at all and um, I think the winging it is just way more difficult now for someone yeah. right absolutely and those who you know are still um working paid leads that are coming straight to the phone and they're used to meeting them for the first time ever Mm -hmm. at the first property. I think there's probably, you know, a struggle 
with those folks. Mm -hmm. But if it's the way that you've always done business before, then that's that part of it is not even a change. I mean, home life, work balance. I mean, what do you yeah. do, you know, right now to, I mean, you've got a daughter, um, you know, you and your husband are active, um, you're running, you know, an office, selling your own real estate. What do you do to, and I want, uh, you know, not just physically, because I know sure. you go to Orange Theory, yeah. that, so that's part of it. Um, and I know that helps with the mental part, but what do you do to get yourself mentally, mentally right, to get your mindset right? Because a lot of this game is mindset. It is. It is. It's that positive mindset. I mean, I, there are five things that I do every single morning. It's just kind of part of my routine. I, before I get out of bed, I think of things that I can be grateful for. Mm-hmm. I, I cannot think of a single person who's successful, who's not deeply, deeply rooted in gratitude. Mm-hmm. And I don't mean like, I'm grateful that I woke up this morning. I am. Mm-hmm. But I mean, like, can you dig deep and can you find gratitude and blessings in places that may not be so obvious? Right. right. So um, last year I lost both parents, one in January oh, and one in May. And how can you find a blessing in that? Mm-hmm. You know, so for me, my mom was always front and center. Dad always kind of was behind the scenes. And she um, she passed first unexpectedly. And for me, it was what a gift she gave us to give him space so that he can have his time with us. And it was just him. And what a blessing it was for me to work in an industry and have people that I can count on and rely on to pick up where I can and be there with him and take advantage of that time so I could be with him and take care of him in the way that he wanted to, the way that I wanted to. Mm-hmm. And I didn't have to do anything for four months other than have complete focus. Mm-hmm. So gratitude is huge. Gratitude is huge. And that translates in what we do because in every deal, there's going to be a problem and receive all those problems as gifts and be grateful that you have problems because right. that means you has you have a deal and right. you have a client so you have people to help. Right. Right. Um, so gratitude is big. I do that every single day. So gratitude is number one. Uh huh. Affirmations. Affirmations. Um, you know, you have to, if you don't believe in you, how the heck is anybody else going right. to believe in you? Right. Um, so affirmations, gratitude. And then I just, I wake up insanely early. So then I just have just quiet time, calm mm-hmm. my mind before the day gets going Mm -hmm. before I get into my task. And then the other things that I do, um, I handwrite two notes every single day to people in my sphere. That's great. Um, That's another way that it stands out. It's special. People don't get handwritten notes. They do it for me. And old school, I mean, my CRM is a sheet of paper, just Mm -hmm. a sheet of my Excel spreadsheet. And I'm not, again, I'm not writing to them about, hey, Mark, do you know anybody who wants to buy or sell? (laughs) It's more like, you know, hey, you know, I see that Gwen's going off to college. Would you give her this $50 gift card so maybe she can use it for gas to come home and see you? That's great. I know your mama's heart has to be hurting right now, but I think you guys have done a good job. Your girl's going to be okay. Right. So it's, you know, really connecting with people. Um, Handwritten notes. Handwritten notes. And And then I look at my day. And then... I look at my hot list. I look at my warm list. So I do all of that before most people get up because then that leaves me having all the things that I, I know that I want to do out of the way. And then that leaves for all of the things that surprises that comes throughout the day. Sure. So you're, you're, you're putting on the shield of armor. You're, you're getting ready to, yeah. to go face the world. Because mm-hmm. yeah. I, I have clients, I have one right now where repairs are being done at her house, not to her satisfaction. So she's sending me information. Um, I'm sure I'll have agents during the time that, we he- that we're here reaching out for, mm-hmm. for guidance um, on what they're working on. But, um, like for, but for me, it, I'm always balanced because this is who I am. Right, right. <laughs> There's not a lot of separation. My clients become my friends. So when I'm getting together with them, for work things, client appreciation things, but I'm just with my friends now. Right, right. So it's kind of all, all the same. That's great. I mean, I think that's the way it should be. Yeah. Yeah. So you were like, just going back again to your career. So you started how many years ago? Only five, five years five, ago. Five, five completed into my sixth year. Yeah. Wow. Yep. And so, 
the team part was how important was that? Like, you know, you mentioned it's critical, Kyle, yeah. You know, and Mike, and so yeah. Did you just kind of plug in the suppliers agent? Is that what you're doing at the beginning? Yeah. So Donnell Milam um, said that I'm expanding my team. Do you know anybody who wants to join or become an agent? And she goes, and do you not like your house? I'm like, I love my house. She goes, well, we didn't take you out of our system, and we can see that you looked at 1,300 houses over the last year. I'm like, well, that's not that many. I'm like, that's like four a day, and I'm looking for other people. <laughs> I said, I'm hoping some of them will call you because I'm like telling them they should call you. But again, it's, you know, it's, it's like most things. You, you think that preparing for the exam and getting your license, you've done the hard part. You have not done the hard part. You need somebody to help you through your deals because um, you've seen one deal, you've seen one deal. Right. Every deal has their own sets of things that you're going to have to troubleshoot and work through, and you're, you will need somebody to show you how to do those things. If nothing else, to bounce off ideas, to spitball mm. information at, and just to challenge, um, to help you have different perspectives on how to market, right. um, how to do things, um, how to not get in trouble, how to not do things wrong. Mm. Um, it was it, For me, it... it it was the absolute best way to launch. What was the biggest, like, for mentally, mile, the milestone that sort of meant the most? Because you, you're as a buyer's yeah. agent, you're, get, um, you're getting provided leads, right, from the team. Mm -hmm. From the team. But I'm assuming, I would, I would venture to guess, that first one that you got that was yours when you yeah. sort of did, was that sort of the milestone? Is you're like, okay, I can do this on my own? Was yeah. That, was there a time where you, like, that was like, okay, this is my launch. Well, it was, it was, well, part, well of it. part of it. It was when I, it was when I met Mike Post in a deal is kind of that point. I'm like, I can do this now. Um, so in my first year, half of the deals came from the team, half came from myself because leading up to getting into real estate, like I told everybody, <laughs> everybody who would listen, who didn't want to listen, like, this is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Um, one of my first clients that I had on my own um, was a gentleman who owns a software development company. He has a bunch of coders and um, all over the world. So in my role at my company, I negotiated their partnership with us. And he was like, well, I know how you negotiate. I was going to put my house on the market with a different agent. I'll wait. <laughs> so I'll wait for you. So the moment I got licensed, you know, I did 1.3 because his purchase at the time was 820,000 and his sale so was five month. something. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Yeah. But then, yeah. but then through the team, you know, I, I was yeah. provided leads yeah. and every one of those leads have become friends after we close and I've done deals with them since. But the big turning point in going on my own was, so one year, exactly one year after I had my license, the world shut down, right? So I was right. licensed March 15th, mm. 2019, March 14, 2020. Yeah. Down. Yeah. So two months after that. What were you thinking? What was I thinking? I'm like, man, I left that corporate job. It was kind of <laughs> cushy. Um, but. We didn't know what the heck. We, nobody knew that day. That weekend, I was like. Okay, I just had four deals fall through overnight because my clients don't know what's going on in their lives. Like I had folks you're wiping down groceries. Before yeah, you the house sometimes. Like yeah, in the very beginning you're like, you don't know what's going uh -huh. on. On the thirteenth, we were writing an offer. On the fourteenth, he was like, I may lose all my money because a lot of the money that I had, I was going to sell stocks to make this purchase, and now I can't. So, you know, that first couple of weeks, but then once things settled down, it was exciting. It was exciting to see how fast things were things were moving and I think you know during that time people was oh my god there's no inventory I'm like how so there's more real estate being moved during this time how could there be no inventory and transactions happening right. you know it's fast moving but there's plenty out there right. um so that was exciting but so two months after that in May is when I met Mike in a deal and um my clients who lived in a state that wasn't as open as ours <laughs> wanted to come and take a look at property and we went out and unsuccessful the first day but built that trust so rapidly in the time that they were here that when they went back to home at the time um and mike posted something about he had coming soon i just called him and said i have your buyer and um the rest was history. Like I worked that deal with him, first one without help, without guidance, because it wasn't easy to get, you know, we weren't going to the office. It wasn't easy to say, can you help me with this? And what do you think about this? It was, now I'm on my own island. 
and that went so well that um you know I'm like I'm ready wow. and you know and Donnell was the first person to congratulate me you know what I mean so it's it's all good that's great that's great so from I mean an immigrant in Laos <laughs> to a luxury real estate broker, not just an agent, but in five short years, we're talking about a trajectory that's just like none other. And in a city that, let's face it, everyone wants to move to. So sure. um, we love Nashville and uh, we've loved having you here, Hattie. So thanks so much for coming. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, continued success to you and your team. Thank you so um, much. What would you like to say I mean, to those out there that may be listening to you right now? That uh, maybe your t- I know you're, a lot of your fans, <laughs> your friends are going to be listening, and maybe even an agent out there that's maybe thinking about making a move. Um, anything you want to say in parting? Yeah. Goodness, there's so much. There's so much to say, especially about Nashville. I love Nashville so much, which is why I like people having helping people move here. I get to show it all, you mm-hmm. know? Um, just do it. Yeah. That's it. Stop thinking about it. Stop thinking about it. Just do it. That's right. Yeah. We're ready. We'll find a way. Good to see you. You as well. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next time.